Cashflow Diary Podcast, episode 380. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cashflow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cashflow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because, you know, what's really interesting about your journey as you go through, well, life and business, etc., is that you may end up wearing many hats over the time. You may become something that you never expected at, at any given moment in time, and ultimately, you may pop out the other end going, wow, this is amazing all the experience that i've had and things that i've done and now you get to use them in completely different capacities than you ever expected but more importantly you're out there serving people and and you're doing the things that you care about deeply well i have with me today a person who i believe exemplifies things exactly like i just said but more importantly here's what makes her unique She's a lawyer with a personality and that's exciting to me because that means you and i are going to not only learn a lot but she's also done a lot, and I'll tell you some of those things in a moment, but it's not going to be like, oh my God, I got to talk to a lawyer. No, 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 no. It's going to be fun. It's going to be ready. It's going to be relevant, and most importantly, it's going to be actionable. Think of this. Wouldn't it be interesting if you could pick the brain of someone who oversaw over 7 million square feet of real estate for a company like Amazon? Well, that's who we're talking to today. What what if that person, same person, was a, a, a leadership consultant as well? Do you think there's some lessons that can be learned? I would say so. Even more than that, she's got a new book. It's called The Journey of Not Knowing. How 21st Century Leaders Can Chart a Course Where There Is None. Have you ever wondered, can my idea make it? Or more importantly, can I build the team that can help us get to where I want to go? Well, I think we're going to get some insights into that too. I have with me today none other than Julie Benazet. So help me welcome, help me get ready, and you get your iPad or notepad ready because here's what I know. It's time to learn. Let's talk to Julie. Julie, you there? I am there. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been described as a, a lawyer with a personality before. Usually when you say lawyer, the people run for the exit. So. <laughs> I know, but that's why I, that's why I'm like, hey, guys, don't tune out this time. Lawyer no. with personality. There's, I mean, yeah. you're like a unicorn. Yeah, well, yeah, there's a point on my head. True. <laughs> exactly. That That is kind of my point. Now, this being your first time here, I tend to ask everybody the same question the first time that they're here. Are you ready? I'm ready. Awesome. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Wonder Woman, Batgirl, Black Widow, Spider-Man, etc. Superheroes. Because I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. For example, occasionally as an entrepreneur, you can envision yourself as, you know, wearing tights and a cape and swooping around and saving your customers with your products and services. But also, like superheroes, entrepreneurs have a beginning. I mean, if you think about Spider-Man, he was just a college kid. He was taking some photos. And then one day... He gets bit by a spider and has now new choices to make about how he's going to use this skill set that he's discovered and is he going to use it for good or for evil. Now, my question to you is, before all of your time at Amazon, before your book, before leadership consulting, before all the things that you are known for and have done, my question to you is, who is Julie Benazette? She is a girl who used to sit up in a maple tree in Colorado Springs, Colorado, uh, trying to figure out how to make a better tree house. Uh, I was a dreamer. I lived, Colorado Springs was a boom town, which I thought was very exciting. 
And at night, I'd literally watch the count the cars coming off the exit ramp of I-25 saying, more people are moving to Colorado Springs. Why? I don't know. But I've always had a love affair with the new, with the better, with things moving into a different place. So it started in the treehouse, it moved to the sandbox, and eventually moved into a career in psychology where I got to find a lot of people who really found a different way of being. But <laughs> I, when I figured out I'd rather run a clinic than be a clinician, I shifted into law, and we know about that, and then became a business person and realized it was always trying to build something to make it different and loving the scariness of that, that you can't make something new without going into a scary place and being okay with that. And that's what, that is what really informed my career. Interesting, interesting, because you just got everybody's attention when you said you enjoy the scariness of it. Everyone is like trying to run the other direction. Now, before we go to that, though, did you really stay up night counting cars? I mean, <laughs> I'm like, what? I, you know, I've just confessed it in front of you know, the whole world here. But yes, I did. Oh. And uh, it was pretty exciting to me. Well, I was an insomniac, so I had to do something. Some wow. people count sheep. I counted cars, headlights coming off a freeway ramp. Wow. Okay, that's a new one. Uh, but all right, that's good. That's good. Now, I guess then the question becomes, what was that? Uh, do you Do you feel like you were just born an entrepreneur, i.e., you were always, were you the newspaper routes trying to make that happen? Did you like sell all the Girl Scout cookies in the girls, uh, in the <laughs> troop? I mean, do, where did you begin to discover or exercise your, your entrepreneurialness, if we will? You know, I didn't know what it was except in the rearview rear view mirror. It was never about making money. It was just the excitement of, of making something different. And I was actually very shy. For a long time, I got over it, but uh, life would do that to you. But uh, it was, I don't think you're necessarily born that way, but I was allowed to be that way. Mm. And, uh, and uh, you know, I was one of many children, and my parents could only discipline so many of us, and I came along in the latter part of the pack, and so I just got <laughs> to be the person I was. And I got a lot of reinforcement for, from people along the way who liked my edginess, who liked my questioning. And I knew how to do it in a way that I didn't turn people off when my parents insisted on manners. Mm -hmm. But I also, at the same time, had got such a kick out of it that it just built upon itself. But I don't think you have to be born that way. I think you can come into it. Well, what's interesting about what you bring up, okay, so you, you like human behavior and psychology. It's like the nature versus nurture conversation. And what I hear you saying is you were when you said you were allowed to be that way, it sounds like either by default because there were so many kids or because you're parents had said, hey, let Julie be whatever Julie's going to be, the environment was conducive to exploration and, and un, you know, discovery. Uh, it was conducive. Uh, my father ran colleges for a living, so I was in a sort of an, an entrepreneurial environment. I see. But um, it was also about knowledge that go discover, go find things out. And uh, I think that that is something that is a common root among entrepreneurs right. is they've got a curiosity factor there that is high. And uh, what's hard to see is when it, it gets squelched or their own fear gets in the way that the, the downside of being an entrepreneur and the scariness of it is that it, it's scary. And <laughs> you spend a lot of time worried and not knowing quite what to do. And you have to have a reason to persevere. So that I find along the way a couple of things distinguish the people who go forward in this world as an entrepreneur and those who don't. And one is uh, having a strong sense of purpose. What do I want to do with this? Do I, what do I want to make better? And who do I want to make it better for? You've got to pick your population. If you're building a business, who is your customer really? And which customer do you need to serve and can you serve? Are you good with little kids? Are you good with old people? Are you good with rich people? Are you good with poor people? You know, are you good with highly educated people? Are you good with anybody? So you pick. <laughs> <laughs> you, just, you just pick. Uh, but 
then when you have your sense of pur- purpose, it helps to help you to deal with the uncertainty that you live with when you go out and experiment with your ideas. And the second thing that gets in the way, that can get in the way of people moving forward to being an entrepreneur is uh, what I call in my book, hooks. These are defensive behaviors that are very typical. They're things like perfectionism, personalizing, conflict avoidance, um, micromanagement, things that give you near-term comfort. Uh, You know, if I could just get this little font fixed right now or get the package just so or get this letter written just right, then I'll be okay. And what it does is it helps settle down the, the anxiety but it takes you off the pathway to a bigger idea of, I really wanted to try creating a new tutorial program that hasn't been tried before. And um, I have no idea if it's going to turn out, but I really want to try it. But right now I'm going to sweat over this proposal and I just can't quite get this one turn of phrase right. And so you hide in there instead of pushing through it. And we all do it. And the trick is to recognize it and say, okay, I need to get over this. Uh, this is just a sideshow. Uh, I need to get back to my purpose and go after it. You know, I, I think you just set some people free right there with the words, <laughs> we all do it. Because there can be this perception that, well, Julie would never be afraid of this. And this, Julie, there's no way. I mean, <laughs> you know, they, these things don't happen. And there's got to be something wrong with me because, or I must not be an entrepreneur if, because there's no way, you know, Elon Musk, he doesn't get afraid. He knows, he always knows what's going on, you know, or, or in your case, uh, Jeff Bezos, he knows exactly the plan, right? You yeah. know, but you said we all do it. So why do you think we might make that separation between the, an entrepreneur whom we view as made it or doing it versus ourselves? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I think we fantasize that they've got something we don't. Um, yes, I, I did work for Bezos, and I was around him a lot. And if you looked behind those brown eyes, he was terrified most of the time. And we, I think we live with this illusion that in order to be successful, we have to be confident. You know, I've, I've taught leadership for many years, and when I've taught it, and ask people, you know, what is a leader? What's the primary characteristic of a leader? They'll say, confident. I said, really? <laughs> so, mm, not the word that came to mind for me, but I get it. Yeah, but yeah, there's a difference. I think there's a, something called co- uh, confident behavior, which is executive presence. And that does not mean you know all the answers. In fact, if you think you know all the answers, you're going to fail because you're going to miss things. Right. But it means you know how you're going to get there. And that, to me, is the difference, that the Elon Musk, I've never met the man, but I've met, of course, I've met Bezos and many like him. And I, what I see them do is they just push and push, say, okay, I'm just going to be this way and because um, I want this other thing so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, Bezos used to always say it's only day one. And what he meant was we're always starting out at the beginning and treating it like we have everything to learn. And when you're in that mindset, uh, that's not a relaxing mindset. So while he was very confident about he was going to ask questions and challenge and exact things from us, at the same time, he didn't know how these things were going to turn out, and he was okay with that. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and it kind of turned out for it, didn't it? <laughs> it well, it, it seems to be okay at the moment. Now, but but my <laughs> question is, when you say that we fantasize that they have something we don't, isn't that really just a, another way of saying we're afraid and we're looking for a justification for that fear? Very possibly. Uh, he, I think that uh, it's very easy to hide our fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, people like to color between the lines to make sure that they are only doing what's known rather than what's not known. Mm. And uh, they don't want to live in that unknown place. If uh, They want to know how it's going to come out, and they want to know right away. And so you find people getting very tactical and uh, doing checking things off lists and uh, then wondering why they're frustrated and bored. 
but uh, it's because being afraid is not okay for them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so so take us to this journey of how you go from, you know, uh, well, learning that you didn't want to be a clinician to becoming the business owner, but more importantly, how did you end up at Amazon? Because none of this makes sense. It doesn't seem to flow yet, like <laughs> the natural step from one to the next. I don't see Are it. You- you're you're suggesting there was consistency in my life? Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> suggesting quite the opposite because there's uh, a story there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, let's see. Should I tell uh, how to tell this? Uh, I did migrate from law into real estate, um, and because I love to build things, and I think real estate's fascinating, so I ended up at a real estate company, and then migrated from there to running a a sell site company, which is uh, not the most beautiful real estate you'll ever see, but there sure were a lot of sell sites going up in the Mm. mid-90s. But what it does was the cellular industry was an industry that everybody was new to it. Everybody was a mutt. Uh, they all came from someplace else because that industry didn't exist before. Mm -hmm. And it put me in an environment where everything was new and crazy and to be tested. And I loved it. (laughs) So um, out of there, um, I moved into real estate consulting and I was having dinner with a friend one night and I was talking about a project I was working on. And I've spent my life jumping between business and real estate. Mm-hmm. And so I would jump back into the real estate section and, and we're sitting there uh, sucking down our Chardonnay. Mm-hmm. And I was describing how we we're going to redo this the configuration of this tower where the um, flow of the floor was a U-shaped and how we we're going to change it so it would be a circular shape, which would improve the circulation and the value of the building. And the woman looks at me and she had a glass pointed and it was Seattle summer, and the sun was glinting through the glass because they it's light late. And she said, looked at me, she said, you know this. And uh, there's a word there that you can't say in prime time. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And I said, what word I can't say? <laughs> and she says, this real estate word we can't say. And she, I said, yeah. And she says, do you want to work for Amazon.com? And I looked at her, and I said, no. <laughs> and <laughs> Nice. I just, I was enjoying my freedom. I uh, didn't want to be a W-2 again. She said, no, wait. Uh, And she was Amazon's first customer service director. She says, finish off your glass. We're going for a drive. So I finished off the glass. And yes, to your audience, this was just one glass. And we drove uh, down to the south of Seattle to a distribution center. And I had worked in the industrial sector a lot, so I knew what to expect. I expect pallets and forklifts and people on the back porch smoking. And we pull up, and there's this very quiet building, and there are three people sitting on the outside reading books. Like, <laughs> books? <laughs> Girly magazines, maybe, but books? You're right. And Those so have we, words in it. <laughs> What's up with that? Know, like, and they look like they've been taking them in. It was an extraordinary image. So we walk in, and in lieu of this world of conveying, conveying machines and um, packaging things, there were library cards and banks of computer monitors, and it was this hush silence. And I looked around and said, what the heck is this? <laughs> this was Amazon.com. Mm-hmm. And I found myself pulled in. I was so intrigued. I'd been a finance lawyer, so I had financed new businesses for a long time. And I looked around at this and said, there's something about this that's very attractive to me. It's all new. It's all experiments. And uh, win, lose, or draw, this story is always going to get told. Um, I can be in, uh, employed, self-employed again any time. But this might be worth being a W-2. Now, did I make that decision at that point in the middle of the floor? No way. (laughs) I fought them tooth and nail. And uh, when they finally made me a proposal that not only uh, I had made 
some kind. I did a project for them as a consultant, and I walked out of there saying, they don't get it. They really don't get it. They didn't listen to me, and I went furious and went back and refilled my pipeline of clients. And um, they, uh, the next morning, I, or I get a call. Actually, it was the next evening I get a call, and it was uh, the CIO of Amazon. Julie, he's from Texas, from Kentucky. Julie, I want you to come here and join our team. I said, no, we had this conversation. I'm not joining your team. Wait a minute. Let's hear me out. <laughs> so I can't think of this guy without to give his accent. And so he went through. In the meantime, my husband and my daughter went off someplace um, to the grocery store. And so this guy lined out a proposal that not only reflected that they completely understood what I told them, but they had gone beyond what I'd asked for as my terms. And one of them was I had to report into the C-suite. I didn't have to report to Bezos. But real estate is the longest lead, least flexible, second most expensive item on the balance sheet. And in order to succeed, particularly in an environment like Amazon, you have to get the business strategy down. And for that, you got to ride at the front of the bus, not the back of the bus, where a lot of real estate people are. And so um, I said, that's my requirement. Otherwise, I don't want to come in and do a bunch of leases. I can do that any place. Mm-hmm. Well, this guy totally got that. And I was going to report to the first chief, the chief logistics officer. So I accepted. I thought, you know, any place that would get this and they were really smart and give me an offer like this, I'd be a fool not to do this. So accepted, didn't dig her much on the phone, uh, poured myself a glass of the Chardonnay, went out in the back porch. <laughs> it's sort of a light motif, the Chardonnay at the beginning of Amazon. So my husband reappears with my daughter. He takes the Chardonnay out of my hand, empties it over the side into the yard. I said, what? Wait, marriage issue. What are you doing? To me? My <laughs> you can't do that. Yeah. And he's got a brown bag. And he reaches in, he pulls out a bottle of Veuve Clicquot, which, you know, that's if if he ever is worried about me being mad, Veuve Clicquot can cure a lot of things. <laughs> so, <laughs> got it. So, so I looked at it and I said, what's that for? He said, to celebrate your new job. I said, what new job? He said, your Amazon job. I said, I had to accept that job when you left this house. He says, Julie, I know you. You would not be able to resist that one. Then I knew why I married him, and then I had the job at Amazon. <laughs> yeah, you're like I chose well. This is good. This is good. <laughs> the movie co was excellent. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Okay, so, but seven million square feet. That's that's a lot of that's a lot of work. I mean, I, I I'm just like in my head that that's like mind boggling in terms of being able to put that together and the logistics required to do all of those things. So why on earth? I mean, if, if that's you, you seem to thrive on the new and the uncertain. Is that why you're, why you wrote a book? Cause it was new and uncertain or what, what, what was it that drives you to now do this new thing? One of the great things about being an entrepreneur is well, doing new things. It's been said to me recently, someone said, Hey, you know, Jay, every time I talk to you, it sounds like you have a, different life it's like there are so many different things that you've done so many different phases it's amazing and while that's true I think it's also true that each one of you or or we're all growing at completely different rates and based upon the speed of that growth or your willingness to change you're gonna have what feels like different lives to some degree but I think that's exciting So if you want to continue joining on completely different lives, uh, I've got something special for you. I want you to go over to cashflowdiary.com forward slash the blueprint, cashflowdiary.com forward slash the blueprint. One of the things that has happened is that I've discovered a very interesting way to increase the cash flow from short term rentals so that your real estate makes significantly more money. If you want to find out more about that, go to cashflowdiary.com forward slash the blueprint. Now, let's get back to the rest of this story. I don't know. I think that one may have been masochism. Um, 
<laughs> yeah, that's code right. for writing a book is more work than you might think, guys. But go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you probably hear that all the time. Uh, yes. Um, the book was, I came up with the journey of not knowing concept about eight years ago. I was teaching mm-hmm. leadership um, to execs. And, um, and I was coaching a bunch of them and, um, it's in that process, I read a lot of leadership books and they're all kind of straight up and fine. And, and they produced a lot of checklists that are not wrong, but to me, they kept missing what were to me was the essence of being a leader. Mm. And to me, and what it was missing was the visceral piece that my experience of being a leader and working with leaders was about this edginess, this fear factor, this thing about going beyond, that if you just fulfilled those checklists, you're not going to succeed as a leader because you're going to be too careful, Mm. too cautious. You're Mm. not going to dream hard enough. And so um, it literally came upon me one day sitting, I don't even know where I was sitting, that... Was Chardonnay uh, involved? No Chardonnay. (laughs) I don't drink that much Chardonnay. No, there was a pattern. I just didn't know how. No, by that time, probably red wine. But (laughs) I I was probably sitting in my office with a cup of Seattle coffee. You know, Seattle drug of choice. Right. And um, I, it, it suddenly struck me that what being a leader is being comfortable with the discomfort of not knowing. And that turn of phrase just suddenly went, oh, and I relaxed. I said, that's what it is. So being an entrepreneur, I tested it on a a number of my clients and friends who were uh, executives, and they all had the same reaction. Their shoulders sank down, and they went, oh, that's it. (laughs) And it gave them permission to have the scary feelings that they have. So I said, ooh, um, wow. Um, maybe I got something here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, uh, entrepreneurs, you always have to put yourself in a pathway of peril. So how do you test something, but you decide to present it as a concept to a group of people, even though you don't have the concept baked? Mm -hmm. So I applied to Vistage, which is a national uh, executive peer-based program, where once a month, a bunch of executives all over the country get together and talk about business things. And I applied to do a pilot presentation of the journey of not knowing, which is what I I titled this concept. And all I wanted to hear was 20 execs saying, this was great or this is really stupid, go do something else. And so I, being a lawyer still, I could write two paragraphs and I wrote two paragraphs and was accepted. And I said, oh, no, now what do I do? <laughs> Dang it. It they worked. Call my, they call my bluff. Yeah, right. So I had uh, four months to put together to tease out the concept, and which I did, of uh, creating a system of understanding that your job as a leader is to come up with bigger bets, how to make things better. It's not just making a better product or service. It's making a better leadership team, a better communication culture, a better talent uh, development scheme. It's about lifting the game. And in order to do that, you have to go to experience risk and, and be, and that's the scariness part because you have to go test it. And while you're testing it, you have to do these other two things I mentioned earlier is you have to have a purpose for doing it and you have to not get tripped up by your own defenses. So I created a system around that mm. and I went and I pitched it to this, these guys and I've never been more terrified in my life because uh, I felt too much was on the line. And when you're an entrepreneur, you live it and you are it. And this yeah. one I couldn't get any distance from. Uh, and at the end, I got 20 thumbs up, and it was very exciting. So out of them, um, I taught uh, at Harvard for 10 years in executive ed, and I, I introduced the concept there. And um, then after 10 years, I decided that I, um, I'd had enough. Uh, this is a fully amortized experience, and I <laughs> loved it, but <laughs> that was enough. And... Um, I was back in my office in Seattle, and I was sitting in my chair saying, I turned Harvard down. That's really exciting. <laughs> I was really proud of myself. <laughs> Verse snobbable, I guess. 
And um, but we left in excellent terms. And in walks a colleague of mine saying, "I just got this opportunity from a senior executive of mine who I coach at Microsoft, who just inherited 23 new executives." And he asked me if I could lead some kind of year-long leadership development program. And I told him, I don't have anything in the can, but I've been talking to you about this journey of not knowing. And Mm. and she said, uh, he said, well, what's that? And she told him the concept because she really liked it. And he says, well, why don't you do that? She says, well, I told you it's not in the can. He said, well, why don't you put it in the can of Microsoft Dollar? (laughs) He said, I'll go ask Julie. So she came in and asked me, and I looked at her and said, what's the question in this question? <laughs> <laughs> this is a long answer to your short question, but it, what happened is we swung into creating a year-long program that is eight sessions long about the core leadership pro- tenets of the journey of not knowing, and then applying it to core leadership competencies. And every year people, and then I gave a lot of speeches on it. And every year people kept saying, where's the book? Where's the <laughs> words I can't say on the radio? Where, uh, book. I said, it's in my head somewhere. Right. <laughs> right. So finally, five years had gone by and I had run out of excuses and I wanted to put it the pen to paper. And talk about what I'd learned myself in this journey of not knowing. So I finally wrote a book and I wrote it in a way that was as hard as I could make it. Uh, and I wrote it as a piece of fiction. So it's a story. Nice. That, that illustrates the concepts. Um, I like that. Pe- people like it. So. Yeah. 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 No, I, I get that. I get that. And you, you touch on some things that, um, that, that I know inside of our cash flow diary community, we're dealing with all the time because people come to me and and they want techniques, and that's great. Uh, and we can easily help you with those things to be able to execute real estate, make those things happen. That's the quote-unquote easy part. But learning to be comfortable with this uncertainty, that that throws people for a loop and not the, the, the not knowing part. So here's the question. In your opinion, based upon the exposure you've had, does an entrepreneur – have to be? Is it a mandatory prerequisite? Do they have to thrive on uncertainty to make it? I don't know if you have to thrive, but you have to be okay with it if you can get What does that mean? What is okay? Because some, I mean, people will say, I'm okay, but then they freak out as soon as something is unknown and freeze. What is okay? How does one know? Uh, Well, we all allowed to freak out at times. Sometimes that's the appropriate response. (laughs) Hold on. I need you to say that again because someone was like walking the dog on the treadmill and they didn't understand how important that was. So ready, go. <laughs> you, What you're doing when you are building, when you're an entrepreneur, is you are trying to build something that people want to pay for or use. Right. And um, in order – and the – the stuff that's already done is done. So if you're building a business on something that is new, it by definition has not been done. So it really goes to how okay you are with not knowing the outcome. And it doesn't mean you have to be a nervous wreck about it, but you have to recognize that um, you're not going to have, you're not going to be able to say for sure where this is going to go. And you have to live with things like criticism from other people, mm. passive aggression when they say, Oh, I don't want it. And, well, that's nice. You know, good luck with that. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're in a job, because these concepts don't apply just to leaders. They apply to anybody really. And you may be in at your work environment and you could lose your job over it because you've tried to, to, to try this new concept and they say, well, that was a failure. So there are a lot of reasons to to not like it, but the point is if you're going to try it and and it hasn't been tried before, that you're going to have yourself on the line, and that's what you have to be okay about. And maybe you know it's no is it a requirement that you have to be scared? No. But I know very few people who, when they get when it gets right down to it, don't admit there's a piece of it 
that at least they said, well, my ego was a little on the line, or and I kind of couldn't wait to see what was going to happen. There's some aspect, so we all have, all have our own version of it. Mm-hmm. But but I think if you're just kind of calm, zen, zen-like around it, my feeling is you probably aren't totally noticing what's going on, because as they're testing it, they might well dislike pieces of it. And then what are you going to do? Right. Totally makes sense. Now, you mentioned earlier this concept of, of hooks, these defensive behaviors that uh, are often triggered, if you will, along this journey. Uh, I guess, what are some of those? And more importantly, what what have you found to be like one of the most damaging kind? Uh, the biggest hook, and uh, there's 10 that I identif- have identified, but there's certainly more. Uh, but they're all ones we know. Uh, micromanagement, uh, conflict avoidance, personalizing, perfectionism, uh, disengagement. It's, um, the list goes on. The, probably the top three mm-hmm. are micromanagement, personalizing, and conflict avoidance. Conflict al- avoidance probably being the largest of all the three. So let's start with that one. How does one? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to deal with that. No, yeah, exactly right. Okay, see, you just hit the you hit the nail on the head. Um, because I I can think of a time where I that's definitely something that has uh, plagued me or come up, but before yet uh, learning over time that I, I just had to deal with and face it. And and what would you say? Uh, how can one know? Because there's also the person who goes, oh, that's not me. I'm not a conflict of order. I charge right in. And they could very well be the conflict of order who just doesn't realize it. How, what are some of those signs? Oh, that's a great way of putting it. Um, a conflict of order is somebody who doesn't want to deal with not knowing how the other person's going to react. And they themselves not knowing it, uh, how everything goes. Um, the thing that's hard in uh conflict is in order to get through it you have to not be you have to be okay with standing alone because at the end of the day the person in the room is you and you need to be held up by what your goal is for the situation and who you are as a person because however the other person's going to react you're going to have, get challenged by it so what can happen in conflict avoidance is people will find ways of stepping to the side of a person challenging them uh, or suggesting to them that they're not right. The person, the one that you describe, and where you see it showing up is there's four main kinds of conflict avoidance. One is pure uh, capitulation, is uh, somebody comes roaring in at you, starts yelling at you, and you just say, no, no, it's all good. You're right. It's totally okay. Uh, inside you're going, I hate this. I want to get out of here as fast as possible. And I really don't agree, but I cannot stand what this person's doing. So that's the capitulator. The second one is the disengager, the person who just disappears in the conversation. (laughs) They may be physically there, but mentally they have just walked out of the room. They just not taken this in at all. And you'll and you'll know because if you're in there, and I watched this happen when two women that uh, were, had this business together were in my office, and they were in this huge fight with each other. Well, one was fighting, the other was just sitting there, disappeared. So one was literally leaning over the t- table with wagging her finger at her, saying, "I can't believe you let that happen. You don't even care." And basically breaking every law of constructive engagement. And the other person was just quiet. And I finally stopped the the action. I said to this other person, "Uh, where are you? She says, oh, I left five five minutes ago. (laughs) So that's the disengager. And um, the third, and because she had no history in her family, she grew up where both are in a family of four kids and two parents are academic deans. And I said, what do you mean? Four kids and you never fought? Oh, what a squandered opportunity. I can't believe that. <laughs> she says, she says uh, no, uh, we didn't. Uh, it was all about rational behavior. So that's the second. Uh, so that's what's the way she did. The third one's the passive aggressive one where you kind of look around and you just kind of 
sigh and roll your eyes and yeah, sure, fine, whatever. And whatever is a very passive aggressive response. It's the dismissive thing. It's I'm not going to deal with you. Uh, I just, I can't even deal with you. Instead of finding out what that person really needs and why there's a problem and what needs to be solved, you're just going to remove yourself from it in a kind of, kind of a ascendant way. Mm -hmm. The last one is the one that people often miss. It's the one you actually were describing, and that's the bully. Mm. The bullies are the hit and run. And everybody thinks because bullies come in hard charging and seem so command and assertive that they're not conflict avoiders. But if you notice, a bully isn't sticking around to see how this comes out. They don't want to know that they might be wrong. So they'd rather just count on the fact that you're not going to push back because you're afraid of bullies, and they'll go off. And you notice that bullies don't bully everybody. They pick the people who are afraid of bullies, and they carry out the stuff there. But for the, uh, if you take a, a bully off to the side, you'll find that a half the time they don't even know they're doing it. The other half of the time, they know they're doing it. But in neither time are they coming from a place of strength. They really didn't want to dive too, dive too deep because what if they came out of there not on top? And that's not a good place for them to be. Indeed. And just so that I'm clear, that wasn't supposed to read like a checklist, right? <laughs> <laughs> No, that was philosophical. <laughs> you got it, got it, got it. I'm just making sure because some uh, I know some people listening were going, "Yep, did that. Yep, did that." I mean, if yeah. you're like me, that's what I was doing. I was going, mm. "Yeah, yeah." I well, I one. the ten hooks. I have to say that uh, when I've presented them to groups, uh, two things help people. One is that I say it's normal, and they go, Phew, "Okay." And the other thing that I say is. Um, they're very familiar to everybody. And so they feel, okay, we're all right. Um, we're not crazy. Well, I might be crazy, but, you know, I'm just Well, saying. but maybe for more enjoyable reasons. <laughs> I don't want to put down craziness. No, no, no. I think there's an element that where we have to be. I mean, you, we're we're taking our life into our own hands with an unknown, unproven product or service and asking other people to join us on the ride. That's right. You well, got to be a little something off. If that's yeah, the, if, you know, you lived a little bit of that, that in your own business, haven't you? A lot of bit. A lot of bit. Yeah, a lot of bit. A lot of bit for, I mean, for all of various and sundry reasons. I mean, every time you come up with an idea, you're wondering, can it work? It sounds like it is. I mean, especially if you're listening to your customers, you know, you come up with this, hey, this sounds like something they need, I think. And you, you start that experiment process and you get that feedback loop and then you're like, hmm, I don't know where this is going to go, but it, when <laughs> when I've found myself to be open to the input and we were always able to pivot and make changes, which gets me to the the point when it comes to the, the journey of, of just not knowing, uh, at, at what point during that process do you, does the entrepreneur actually go, you know what, I, I now know, and more importantly, this is the confident way to go, and there's n is there ever this point where there's nothing left to discover? Oh, I hope so. I hope not, because then you've stopped paying attention. However, you do have to make decisions along the way. There is a blow-and-go moment, and um, I think the smart entrepreneurs are the ones who um, take measured risks. They say, okay, here's what I know. This is what I don't know. But the cost of not going forward is higher than the cost of going forward. So I need to go ahead and try this at this point. Interesting. Okay. How does one develop the sense to be able to make that equation? Because I, I have an understanding of what you're you're saying, but is, is there – you got a formula? You got, <laughs> you got a checklist? <laughs> there's no I, checklist for that one. Yeah. <laughs> But there's yeah, expert intuition that you've developed, yeah. and how does that get? How does one get there? Yeah, I wish I had a good scientific response to this, but I'm just going to have to give it to you the way it happens for me and mm -hmm. what I see with others. Is your your stomach is the smartest organ of the body, 
it when you have know enough, it's literally can get really warm and hmm. powerful feeling, and it's time to move forward. And it, when I work with people and they can't make a decision, I'll, they'll say, you just don't have enough information yet. And there's a point where all of a sudden your body says, okay, I'm ready. And you don't have to do this alone. Uh, mm-hmm. p- having colleagues is a fabulous thing. Uh, it's good to go in with to things with plan Bs and feedback loops and high levels of communication and a really good attitude towards failure because that means you were trying something. So you have your checks and balances as you do it. And that's, I think, is the, the best way to experiment when you're in business. I think people who do new things just for the sake of doing new things are setting themselves up for failure. You do have to do some calculation on this. Got it. That makes sense. That makes sense. So for the person who's um, maybe on plan Q, what would you have to say to them? On plan Q? <laughs> plan Q. They've, they've done B, C, D, and E. They still oh. want to make this thing work, but now they're on plan Q. Oh, yeah. boy. Uh, you know, there are certainly um, examples of things that were plan Q. Uh, WD-40 was it started out as a different product, and they tried it on you name it, and um, it didn't work, and didn't work, and didn't work, and didn't work. And finally, they, they realized it worked as a great lubricant. And the forty in WD forty means they tried forty times. So <laughs> there are instances of this. Wow, they were circling but, the alphabet there. I yeah, like it. And, and sometimes practicalities, you may just run out of money. So you just got to move on. Uh, but there is something about perseverance. Uh, is, uh, and if you keep finding what people who are interested in, there's some kind of small incremental movement, then there may be reasons to go forward. But the practicality does take over at some point. At some point as an entrepreneur, quite honestly, entrepreneurs get bored. You know, you've had enough mm-hmm. of this idea. Mm-hmm. It may reappear later. But... Uh, yeah, there. I have definitely seen examples of when they needed to call it quits, where they have really emptied every coffer and exhausted every potential customer. And at that point, they're just wearing everybody out. And that's time to quit. Yeah, I get that. Totally get that. So for, for those that have listened this far, Julie, and want to, to pick up maybe a copy of the book, or more importantly, connect with you and, and, and sample some more of your awesome wisdom, what's going to be the best way for them to do that? There is a website called journeyofnotknowing.com. The book is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and any one of a number of ebook channels, including Apple. So uh, it is also you can uh, get the links to it on the journey of journey of not knowing website. Indeed, indeed. Okay, excellent. So now I've got uh, a final question for you, which. You, I think your answer is going to be not only interesting, but fun. So I, I got to get it out. So oh, No, I think in the future to life, you're going to be a thesis advisor. You think so? <laughs> oh, you get great questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, here, here's what I'm thinking. There's someone listening right now. Let's pretend they're standing in front of the superhero outfit store. They are thinking, I'm going to become this entrepreneur. I'm going to pick out my tights and my cape, and I'm going to fly but at the same time, they have those thoughts, Julie. There's this other voice that is their constant companion. And it's that voice that comes up that often tells us things like, who are you and what do you think you're doing? And you're crazy. And oh, my goodness, don't even bother. And for some people, they're actually related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. Let's pretend that that person who, who's ready to take that leap become that entrepreneur, build their business, make it better, is is going to actually do what you suggest. And they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? Well, I, I think they, the first thing I would do is go out and do something I don't usually do. Go to a different place, talk to a different person, do something that moves you out of your usual routine and get out of the left side of your brain, Hmm. sink into the right side of your brain 
and say, what would be exciting for me? And allow your, yourself to wander. We're so quick about making lists and making, getting the action plan lined out. And I think you've got to pay attention to why that little inner voice has even shown up. Hmm. There's something in there that's trying to get your attention. And I think you start by throwing yourself a little bit off center and exploring what that might be about. Interesting. See, I knew it. I knew it was going to be. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> what is that one? It just came. I'm like, what? Okay, this is good. Because what you actually said was to put yourself in a position where you now don't know again. You're, you're throwing yourself off. And I, and I just like how consistent you've been in, in that way. And I just wouldn't have thought of that uh, as a way to help you you know, gain some clarity on why, why that voice might be there. Um, yeah. With that being said, I, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to discuss with us, talk with us, and, and share your knowledge, insight, and wisdom here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. Well, thank you. It's been wonderful. Great questions. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means the journey of not knowing. Go get it. Why? Because you know you don't know, but more importantly, it's okay. You just know that now. You have a comfort zone. It's okay to not know, but it's not okay to sit still. In fact, if you heard what I heard, you know that we only have everything to learn. It's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs> <laughs>